Okay, uh, good afternoon. Please uh, uh, have a seat. Uh, we're going to start this uh, session. This, uh, quite packed with presentation, but the presentations are very, very short, and we really like to leave time for discussion and questions. Uh, so the objectives, uh, um, nothing of to fear, a guide to combine DCB and DS in hybrid uh, PCI. I have uh, nothing to disclose. Uh, my, I will be the first presenter, we'll discuss uh, uh, and accepted the topic, uh, which is DCB for instant wrist stenosis. Klaus Bonaventura will discuss about uh, combination of DCB and drug eluting stents. Uh, Paul Hong uh, about uh, drug coated balloon in acute coronary syndrome. And uh, Matthew Godin, uh, a guide to use uh, DCB in uh, de novo lesions and bifurcations. So just uh, uh, to continue the session, uh, let's go to uh, DCB for instant wrist stenosis. We all agree that uh, uh, you have no conflicts of interest. We all agree that uh, uh, DCB is uh, uh, a good uh, solution for instant wrist stenosis. Uh, maybe in solution is not the right word, a good approach. Uh, this is the result of the RIPS-4. Uh, in the RIPS-4, the performance of drug-coated balloon was maybe slightly inferior uh, to DES, and we can discuss why that. Uh, I have uh, my, uh, uh, my opinion, but uh, uh, as you can see here, there is a clear advantage uh, in the uh, thrombosis uh, definite, uh, probable, uh, considering the number of the patients, uh, there is no statistical uh, difference. Uh, nevertheless, uh, these numbers are uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, in addition, we all know uh, the possible advantage uh, in uh, reducing the duration of dual, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, uh, I just want to go over our experience uh, uh, that we published uh, of uh, DCB in, or in St. stenosis in, uh, in Milan because we have a uh, good uh, follow-up. Uh, we have uh, used uh, DCB in uh, 166 lesion. Um, angio-following predilatation is key to have uh, a very good result. Uh, I say residual uh, less than 30% uh, TM3, no major dissection, but uh, uh, it's really, you, you need to do an aggressive predilatation, be liberal to use uh, a scoring balloon, a cutting balloon. Uh, we are all aware of the classic paper from the group of Munich uh, showing that with uh, angioscalp uh, you have uh, uh, less uh, uh, re stenosis uh, if you use a drug eluting balloon. Um, so if we have adequate group, uh, 98. So uh, you have to uh, accept uh, that in some lesions, uh, the preparation, uh, even uh, despite high pressure, is not optimal. And if you don't have an optimal preparation, don't waste money and time uh, to put a, a, a drug-coated balloon. Uh, we had uh, no adequate result in 68 lesions, and uh, uh, in the, if you have uh, inadequate result, uh, we did the DCB, but in, in the analysis, uh, when you don't have adequate result, and is uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, red, uh, you have uh, significant events as, as far as re stenosis. Uh, so, if you don't have an adequate result, uh, uh, there is no reason uh, not to cross over uh, to DS. Uh, maybe now uh, we can do some ablative procedures. Uh, we don't have experience of uh, much rotational laterectomy or uh, uh, orbital laterectomy, but uh, maybe some of these procedures uh, should, be, should be considered. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Anecdotally, I just saw a friend of mine who showed me a case of uh, Jan Turco Rubin stent restenosis that we treated 20 years ago with rotablator, and we didn't have drug coated balloon and was still uh, having patency of the vessel. 
this is a study that uh, I was referring to, and this is not well publicized, but this is an important study. Uh, either desire for angioscalp uh, plus DCB versus conventional POB plus DCB. You see the binary stenosis is cut uh, almost uh, half, and uh, the percent diameter stenosis as well. So I would encourage uh, to use uh, these devices for lesion preparation. There are some uh, uh, pathological studies that demonstrate the, the uh, permeability of the lesion uh, to the drug is increased uh, if you do some scoring uh, of the uh, of the restenotic tissue. So this is very very important. So to finish, uh, this is a well uh, read, uh, hopefully, uh, paper uh, in Jack 2020. Uh, that uh, uh, stresses the optimal lesion preparation. And as a matter of fact, you see there is a lithotripsy, rotablation, uh, functional measurement, IVUS. All these devices have to be used, especially if the restenosis is diffuse. Uh, and uh, even worse uh, if you have a total occlusion. And if you have an adequate result, I think it's use of DCB. Otherwise, uh, you do stent uh, or something else. And to me, this is the explanation why in the RIPS4, the results were a little bit mediocre because uh, the dictum uh, to follow optimal lesion preparation and not to use DCB if you do not have good lesion preparation was not uh, well followed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Antonio, for this great introduction and overview. Uh, the um, I think we are a little bit late in time. We will skip to the next presentation uh, from Klaus Bonaventura. Um, now we are talking about treatment of de novo diseases and the potential role DCB can play here. Dear chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the hyper approach in PCI. So, this is my disclosure. Um, in general, hyper techniques are a combination of two or more techniques which provide more advantages than the limitation on a single technique, and they help to improve procedural and clinical results. In the field of interventional, coronary interventional cardiology, each of them, DS and DCB, have their own strengths and weaknesses, and the hybrid approach combines the strengths of both of them. In the hyperpilot study, we found 100 patients with de novo lesions in diffuse coronary disease and different reference vessel diameter. They used the DCB for the distal lesions and for side branches of bifurcation, so in small vessel disease, and the new generation DES for proximal or larger lesions. The results have been presented this morning showing that this strategy is in general feasible. But the motivation for the hybrid approach of DES and DCB was most, mostly motivated by using the DCB as an alternative to limit the total stent length or to ask the question, where are special limitations or situations to use the DCB? We all made experiences with the use of the DCB in the novo coronary lesions. We made the experience of the positive vessel remodeling and the lumen enlargement, which happens in almost 70% of the cases. And we have recent data about the vasomotion. This study included 132 DCB procedures. All patients were treated with DCB, secret is new, and they checked the response to ergonovine or to the nitrates at the angiographic follow-up of six to nine months. They checked the response to ergonovine or to nitrates at the location of the DCB-treated segment and at the reference uh, segment of an angiographic normal artery. And the DCB-treated lesions were not particularly vulnerable to vasospasm, and were found to have a vasomotor function similar to an angiographically, angiographically normal segments. We have data for small vessel disease in the novo coronary lesions. We have data from the basket small 2 trial. They included almost 900 patients. And the patients were almost treated in a diameter of 2, greater than 2, and less than 3 millimeters. They all were all treated, or with the Zekin Please Neo, with the DCB, or with the DS, newest generation Taxus Oxyens. And the primary endpoint was the clinical outcome at 12 months, cardiac death, non-fatal MI or target vessel revascularization, and DCB was non-inferior to the use of the DS. And there were so no significant differences whether the patients came with chronic coronary disease or in acute coronary syndromes. And by the way, the study was called 
basket small, but they included almost 900 lesions in a diameter from greater than 2 to less than 3 millimeters, but mean size of DCB and DS was 2.75 millimeters. It means we have also results for small and for larger vessels. But we have also dedicated data for the larger vessel disease. We have the DEPU trial and we have the data from this Chinese institute. They included almost 600 de novo lesions in a diameter of greater than 2.8 or less. And the clinical follow-up at 10 months shows what works in small vessel disease also works in larger vessel disease. They did the angiographic follow-up after a time horizon of 10 months. And you see that late lumen loss was negative and the positive modeling was 0.17 millimeters in the larger vessel disease group and in the small vessel disease group. We learned a lot about the lesion preparation. Antonio already presented the treatment algorithm from the International DCP Consensus Group. We start to achieve a best possible optimal lesion preparation. This can be performed by any available tool in our CAS lab. And at the result of the lesion preparation, we look for the angiographic result, and then we decide whether the DCB, in case of an acceptable angiographic result, can be used, or we need the DS in case of a suboptimal angiographic result. What is an acceptable angiographic result? We have a no flow limiting dissection. We have a residual lesion of less than 30% or an FFR measurement greater than 0.80. In our password observational study, it was a prospective multicenter single armed all comer study in patients with de novo lesions or ISR. We included almost 500 lesions. All patients were treated with the scoring balloon, the lacrosse NSA or NSE alpha, and followed by the DCB second please NEO. Primary endpoint was target lesion failure at nine months. The needed bailout stenting in the novo lesions was only 1.3%. And the clinical outcomes for the de novo lesions at nine months was a TLR of 0.8%, a TLF of 1.1%, and a myocardial infarction or thrombosis happened in not any patient. There was no difference whether the vessel was calcified or not. And there was no difference in the results whether it was a small vessel disease or a large vessel disease. So in summary, truck-coated balloons have a lower or comparable TLR compared to the new generation DS. And they keep vessel motion in contrast to DS. New generation truck-eluting stents have a persistent risk of late or very late stent thrombosis, but they are superior to the use of a DCB to treat severe recoil and flow-limiting dissection. Let me show you the hybrid approach in three short examples. This female patient, she presented with NSTEMI, and we found in the mid-LAD a tight lesion. It was a Medina 111 situation. So after lesion preparation for both, for LAD and diagonal branch, with Emerge 3.515 and Emerge 2.7515, we found a suboptimal angiographic result for both sides. So in this case, we decided to do a double cross stenting, and we're using two DES Coreflex ISA Neo, 3.519 and 2.7519. We did post dilatation and kissing, and the final result after two DES was very acceptable. The patient came back after three months, and again, we find a good long-term result for both sides, for the LED and for the diagonal branch. This female patient, she also presented with unstable angina. We, again, we found a bifurcation lesion in the mid-LAD. In the lateral view, you can see, again, it's a Medina 111 situation. We predilated both. Lesion preparation was done for the diagonal branch with a scoring balloon NSE alpha 2.513. For the mid-LAD, again, scoring balloon NSE alpha 3.513. And in this case, you might agree, the result of the lesion preparation looked very acceptable. So therefore, we decided to use two DCB. We used the sequence near near uh, 2.520, so two to three millimeters longer on both sides than the predilated area for the diagonal branch, and 3.520 for the mid-LED. And the final result for the ostium of the diagonal branch and for the mid-LED was very acceptable. The patient came back for FFR measurement of the mid-LED and for pre procedure of the proximal circumflex, and after three months, the midterm result was very good. FFR measurement of mid-LED was negative, by the way. And finally, this female patient, 55 years old, she presented with stable angina and she had a positive stress test for the lateral wall. 
nice to see we had three tight lesions in proximal circumflex, mid circumflex, and distal circumflex. So we did lesion preparation with 3.5 in the proximal part and 2.515 for the mid and for the distal part. For the proximal part, the angiographic result was not acceptable. You might agree. For the mid and for the distal part, the, angio, the result of the lesion preparation was very acceptable. So therefore, we used two sigmoids neo for the mid part and for the distal part, each 2.520, and for the proximal part, a new generation DS Coflex ISA neo 3.516 millimeters. This is the final result after one DS and two DCB. The patient came back after four months, and again we see a nice long-term result for this combined approach. So hybrid approach of stent and DCB means to consider all options. And this might be a stent-only strategy, this might be a DCB-only strategy, but this might also be the combination of stent and DCB in one vessel or even in one lesion. In the era of personalized medicine, it's what I call individualized interventional therapy. The chairman, ladies and gentlemen, DCB showed proven efficacy and safety in the novel lesions. And DCB needs to replace the stenting if the stenting is only for the application of the drug to prevent restenosis. The hybrid approach of DCB and stenting uses all contemporary tools to achieve the best interventional and clinical acute and long-term result. Optimal lesion preparation is a key step for this hybrid treatment strategy. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. I think we have uh, some time for discussion, uh, questions. Antonio, I have a question to you and, and, and um, Klaus. Um, we have seen this case proximal stenting, distal mid DCB. Is, it, is DCB treatment uh, focused on mid and distal lesions or should we also um, think about proximal lesions? Um, I, I think should be used uh, stent only when the predilatation result is unsatisfactory, no matter if it's proximal or distal. At this time, I will uh, still uh, stand the left main because we have to be step by step, but uh, I do not see a reason to place a, st to place a stent in the proximal LED 3.5 if the predilatation result is optimal. Of course, uh, we still do that, but you know, it takes time to, to get out of the habit. We have been doing that for 30 years, so. <laughs> I totally agree. Uh, the example was only by chance. It, m it had, might have been exactly the opposite for the DCB in the proximal part yeah, and the stenting and in the distal part. We do the same sometimes reverse. We don't place a stent uh, proximally and we place a stent distally. Exactly. Uh, it, I think it's a matter of mentality uh, to accept the idea the stenting should not be the default therapy. It used to be a default therapy because angioplasty was uh, aggravated by restenosis. But now if you have an anti-restenotic device uh, that is not necessarily a stent, uh, why not? Mm. So I think we have uh, some questions from the community, Philip. Y yeah, exactly. So there are a couple of questions coming in, maybe related to, to the case presentation. So maybe you can comment on this, Klaus. Um, what about kissing after DCB treatment bifurcation? And the second is related to towards imaging. Uh, and the user asks uh, whether OCT is mandatory. And the second is uh, very easy. OCT is not mandatory, definitely not. And uh, it's a good question whether it's helpful in any way for, for, for this uh, situation. And um, yeah, it, there might be the possibility of a final kissing uh, after the use of, uh, of the DCB. There is no impact on the drug load, but on the other side, if I would only do it if really needed, uh, because if you have an unstented segment and you do a final kissing in final size or almost final size, you have a, a, a huge risk to cause a dissection after the use of the DCB. Right. Thank you. And then there's one more general question coming in. What about the combination of DES and DCB in bifurcation? For example, DES in main branch, DCB in side branch. 
Oh, we, we went, there is no no cross effect or no side effects of this co uh, combination. Uh, definitely, after we try to. Um, uh, to, to, uh, we always use a lime saluting uh, stand in this uh, situation, uh, but uh, if you have a situation you need to stand the main branch and uh, you use the DCB for the side branch, we use the stand the uh, DCB for the side branch first, not to cross uh, the stand shots with the DCB uh, again to to damage the, the the truck load of the DCB. So we finish the side branch first and use stand the stand for the main branch and do a final kissing if really needed. Maybe I think we have a few minutes to discuss, and I think the the, the question about the OCT is a very important question because yeah. at the beginning of uh, our experience, we try sometimes this technique with DCB only, and we perform some uh, OCT. And I think the OCT we can have two risks. You can have the risk to make very fast on high volume uh, dye injection and if you perform an adjoplasty at the proximal part you can induce a very massive uh, dissection maybe. And sometimes also I think you can be afraid with what you can see after the predilatation or after the DCB uh, angioplasty. And all the uh, studies are uh, evaluated, the key points are on angio guiding uh, result. So maybe I will show you two examples uh, after. Um, you don't have to, uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, the results are angio guided and uh, angio guided on A or B dissection can be let uh, with no fear, but more than a C uh, dissection, clearly I think you have to implant a stent. But on OCT, it's clearly not os uh, also uh, so easy to make the difference between B or C or D uh, dissection on OCT. But your point about OCT is very important uh, because uh, one thing is to do OCT after stenting where the lesion is very stable or stabilized, and one thing is to inject uh, without a stent with a small plane of dissection that you can extend. And this can happen also with the assist device. In the old time, we had manual injections, not so forceful, but with the assist device, you may really, and sometimes you see that the lesion deteriorates if you do repeated injections, and you think, I should have stented because the lesion deteriorated. Is you that made the lesion deteriorate. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, uh, continue. Uh, the, next, uh, the next speaker is Dr. Ong. He will uh, uh, discuss uh, in uh, DCB in acute uh, coronary syndrome. Remote? I remote. I'm running in from Singapore. Okay. Um, I've been tasked to talk about uh, the use of drug balloons in acute coronary syndrome patients. Um, I have nothing to declare. So you can see that I uh, will start with a case. Um, I would thought we'll start with the clinical questions first. So first of all, is it even possible or should we be using drug of the balloons in pri as a primary therapy in patients uh, presenting with acute coronary disease? Um, so the question is, you know, is it even effective in the thrombus laden artery? Well, I think we should because, you know, a lot of time we will perform COBA and aspiration. Um, so in this case, shouldn't we stop us from doing it? And particularly in this artery, the plug rupture, usually a soft lesion. So lesion preparation should be pretty straightforward. Can patient tolerate the prolonged balloon inflation? The answer is almost always yes. After all, the, the artery was blocked for a few hours before they come to us. So the reason why a prolonged inflation of 45 seconds to one minute would make any difference. And then are we willing to accept the less than perfect results? So obviously there is not going to be an immediate stand-like result as if we put a stent in, but this allowed the vessel to subsequently grow back in size and remodel. And we've seen some beautiful examples uh, by Dr. Uh, Bruno Ventura early on. I will start with an ECG. Um, this will be the typical patients coming to us, uh, usually in the middle of the night with an anterior infarct. And I would like to show you the angio picture of this patient together with the OCT images. And you can see that here, in most of these cases, they are, in this particular case, it's a plaque erosion, but plaque rupture, there is usually a large uh, lipid pool uh, behind that necrotic lesion. So this is the point which I thought I would like to uh, emphasize. The 
uh, drug called balloons, most of the time we have the Pacotexel drugs on the DCB. Pacotexel as an agent is extremely lipophilic. So there is a possibility for the drugs, obviously, to get into this extremely rich lipid uh, pool in the necrotic plant and potentially hang around, uptaken easily and hang around longer for time and actually exert its therapeutic effect for longer. So are there any clinical trials? And there are actually quite a lot. Here, I quoted the renovation study. It's a randomized trial uh, involving about 120 patients. Half the patients have gone on to the DCB group and the other one gone into the contemporary DES. Um, they followed this patient up um, in, in the nine months uh, to relook at the angio. Here is of interest. I highlighted that in the DCB group, 11 of the patients require additional stenting. And I think all of the panelists will agree with me. Those who are doing day CB day in, day out, you probably will do away with the, 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 the chances of crossover to stenting probably significantly lower than 18%. But anyway, the primary endpoint of the relevation study is that nine months angiographic follow-up with FFR value. So they look at the FFR value of the DCB group on the culprit vessel at nine months is 0.92. And the DES group was 0.91, and it met the non-inferiority criteria. So no difference between the two strategies. Well, that's really encouraging. But when you look at the, the outcomes more carefully in the angiographic endpoint, you can see that in the immediate um, post-intervention during the index procedure, the DCP group, the minimal lumen vessel size was uh, 2.64, whereas the DES group was 2.88, slightly bigger. But fast forward nine months, you notice that the vessel had grown in size slightly to 2.67 in the DCB group. And in the DES group, it dropped a little bit to 2.86, and the two are no longer different, uh, statistically different. And this again, go on to illustrate that in uh, acute coronary syndrome, because of vasospasm and thrombus, et cetera, quite often we underestimate the size the vessel can actually have the potential to grow back if you do not cage it with a stent. Whereas if you put a stent in, the only way for the lumen is to go down. There was another study, which is PEPCAT uh, and STEMI. Uh, you know, my good friend here, uh, Bruno, have actually done a lot of studies and published this status. But again, you know, these are the acute coronary syndrome patient with high bleeding risk. And you can see uh, doing DES and using uh, dimethyl DES uh, compare with uh, DCB, again, there was no difference in the clinical outcome. But granted, the sample size is small and the recruitment phase was really challenging. Our group in Singapore have also published our prelim study looking at the use of drug balloons in uh, primary PCI. I would like to share a case with you here. This is a 46-year-old lady uh, who came to us with inferior STEMI. Uh, the RCA looks okay, so no surprising here. Um, there was osteo-LAD lesion, but the large dominant uh, circumflex was occluded. So after a bit of aspiration and predilatation, there were TME3 was restored, and you can see it here. And the artery was further, the lesion was further prepared. And in this case, we use a score flex, uh, 2.5 by 15. Again, early on, we hear the speaker saying that using score flex balloon, you have better outcome. So lesion preparation is important. So we did that, um, respecting the size of the vessel, did the pre and I thought the result was pretty good. Now, the thinking at the time was this patient may be an option to go for uh, bypass surgery at the later stage, considering that was osteo-LAD disease. So a lot of time when we first uh, move away from DCB use in ISR to DCB use in de novo, we actually started off a lot of time in ACS because that's where we got our experience from. So in this particular patient, we put two sequin fleece balloon in, making sure that we respected no geographic miss, and we got this kind of results back. And I thought the result was okay, and after all, the patient may have to be discussed for surgery. Of course, at six weeks down the line, patient declined surgery, so we brought her her back for angioplasty to the LAD. But at that time, we noticed the circumflex mm -hmm. vessel looks a bit mm -hmm. better. And then the LAD was fixed, so that was okay. But the patient, three months later, has a little bit of chest discomfort, 
and we brought the patient back for another look. And you can see the circumflex vessel actually got even bigger. So this was the immediate result post infarct. This was the result at one month when it came back for stage PCI. And this was the result at three months. And there was obviously some features of positive remodeling, but the artery got bigger. So my conclusions here, I thought it's a nice transition from using DCB slowly for ISR. Moving to ACS patients can be an ideal group of patients for us to start moving in that direction. A lot of time ACS, the soft plug are easy to achieve plug modification, getting you less than 30% residual stenosis and low grade dissection. The ruptured lipid rich plug may be an ideal reservoir for effective pachytaxel uptake, allowing for longer drug exposure. Leaving nothing behind, avoid the trapping of undersizing stents due to vessel spasm in ACS. Thank you very much. Uh, stay with us because we have uh, some time for discussion and questions. So maybe we'll start with, uh, hi, hi Paul, nice to see you again. Hi Bruno, good to see you. Sorry I can't meet you in person. <laughs> yeah. um, we have some, first some questions from the, uh, from the uh, audience uh, via the internet, uh, Philip. Yeah, once again, quite, quite a dynamic discussion uh, online. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, does DCB increase the incidence of immediate slow flow or no flow in the culprit lesion? Bruno, maybe, or, or Paul? I, I, I go first, Bruno, that's okay. I, I don't think so. Um, you know, in fact, what we noticed from the earlier trial is uh, it's the stenting that actually gave us the slow reflow. Most of the time when ballooning, the flow is actually excellent. And if you stop at that point, the risk of those reflow, if anything, is slower. But I would be happy to hear uh, what the other uh, chairs and panelists have to say. Any further comments from the panel? Otherwise, I have further questions. 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 Yeah, maybe, maybe to Dr. Colombo. Um, if after DCP treatment, the angiographic result is good, but FFR is below 0.8, how would you proceed? I, I consider doing a, another dilatation with the balloon. Uh, and below 0.8 is, is not acceptable. I do, and uh, if the result is, is still not acceptable, uh, I implant a stand. But uh, then uh, you have to be really uh, be critical, make sure that the wire doesn't lose calibration, that uh, you are not too distal, because sometimes uh, if you are very distal, you may calculate uh, the diffuse disease. Uh, distal to the lesion. So I think to do a careful pullback and understand uh, where is uh, the step up uh, is very important. But uh, the bottom line is that uh, mm -hmm. if the result is not ac acceptable, uh, you implant a stent. It's not uh, a complication to implant a stent, uh, but uh, it's, it's a very acceptable approach. I have a question for Paul. Uh, besides uh, angiography, uh, do you, how do you evaluate a dissection if it's uh, acceptable or not? Um, we just discussed that sometimes yes. to keep on doing many injections with the, an with the angiography may not be a good idea. So do you have an other approach to evaluate a dissection? Actually, no. I, I think the simple guide of the type A and B being acceptable is still the one I work on. Um, as long as there's TB3 flow and no stain hanging around afterwards, I actually quite happy with that. I also echoed what the other uh, colleagues have said about not using intravascular imaging to create the dissection because a good lesion preparation, there's obviously always going to be dissection. Um, I do, however, Anthony, I do actually use um, intravascular imaging, especially IVIS, in sometimes in assessing lesion because I can size the predilatation balloon better. Um, so sometimes, especially in ACS, the artery looks very small, so we use a small balloon to predilate, and the artery didn't look very good, so I end up having the stents. But of course, once you put an IVIS down, you realize that my two old predilatation balloon grossly undersized. And in this case, when I put a 3.0 or 3.5 balloon in to predilate, I actually have very, very good COBA result, and that patient may end up having DCB rather than getting stents. Uh, uh, Paul, uh, was not, uh, we are not against imaging. We are a little bit perplexed uh, about OCT because of the injection in the vessel, uh, which may 
uh, extend the dissection, but this has nothing to do with, uh, with imaging. Uh, IVUS does not require uh, dye injection. Paul, I have a short question. What to do if you have high thrombus burden? In my, uh, for, in my opinion, this is not a good situation for DCB. What, what do you say? I agree, but in a very high thrombus burden, it's also not a good idea for stenting. So a lot of times, these group patients, after you've done your best to restore TME free flow, uh, quite a lot of us will probably defer. Um, I will bring the patient back in a day or two and see what happened to the vessel. At that point, the, the thrombus should be cleared. Um, then I have a choice of deciding whether I will proceed with DCB or with DES. But uh, I think in heavily thrombus burden artery, either way, I, I probably will be quite careful about uh, putting a stand into. Question. Uh, suppose we are doing a study in a group of patients and they're completely asymptomatic. At six months or nine months, we are looking at the DCB. How do we explain the patient and how we can have an ethical issue with the angiography taking into for an invasive procedure. Follow up in geography in asymptomatic patient, how to explain to the patient as well as what will be the ethical consideration. You mean as control after DCB treatment? Yeah, yeah. Uh, outside of trials there's no indication. Okay. Um, but but if the patient is in a, in a trial he uh, agreed uh, with angiograph follow up, yes, of course. Or it's a second planned procedure but not in routine. I just want to make a comment uh, for the for the imaging. Uh, uh, thank you, Paul, because it, at least our experience by using the the imaging before or after the use of the DCB underlines the need not to undersize the balloons for the lesion preparation. In our commendation, we always say the balloon to vessel ratio of lesion preparation should be Formerly, it was recommended to 0.8 to 1.0. Today, we rather co recommend to use the foliation preparation a balloon to vessel ratio of 1.0 because if it's less, we definitely undersize uh, the balloon. Okay, thank you very much. We go to uh, the next uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Godin, he will discuss about uh, uh, bifurcation lesions and uh, the novel lesions. Uh, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be there to discuss with you um, with a, uh, a guide uh, in denoble lesion and especially in uh, bifurcation. And I will show you at the final part of these topics the latest clinical data from a big registry from uh, west of France so from my co from my colleague. So uh, thank you for uh, to be brought on to the uh, organization for their invitation. So. Um, I will uh, begin with uh, my, one of my first uh, example of uh, DCB-only uh, treatment, uh, angioplasty. It was a very uh, old uh, man, uh, uh, 86 years old, with very severe thrombopenia, and he presented at our cat lab with an instable angina. And you can see this very tight uh, lesion on the ostial and proximal part of the LID. And due to this thrombopenia, we decide for, uh, with, uh, after a discussion with his hematologist, to uh, do an angioplasty only with balloon, with a final uh, angioplasty with DCB for a very short DAPT at, uh, for, for 15 days. So we perform a very careful predilatation and uh, to respect the ratio one to one between the artery and uh, the balloon, because probably if you go uh, up, you can induce some damage on the artery. And uh, you can see here the result of the pr after the predilatation was good. There is a very uh, you know, limited uh, residual stenosis. And so we uh, use a DCB at low atmosphere. And I think the uh, low atmosphere for the DCB is important because it's not the moment to induce some dissection. You have just to release the drug on the antima with this balloon. The advantage for the, uh, the, the bifurcation is you can go very proximal in the bifurcation. You don't have any risk to put some strength, uh, uh, for this example, in the left main because you don't have stent, you don't have strut. And uh, when you perform OCT after uh, this kind of uh, angioplasty, it's very rare to have some lesion of the proximal part of the bifurcation because your balloon is sized on the distal part, on the distal vessel. You can see, we will see uh, in a few minutes. So uh, you can go uh, with this balloon very proximal, even in the proximal part of the bifurcation, and you are sure not to miss 
the hostile part of the bif of the uh, distal vessel of the bifurcation, and sometimes it's a problem when uh, you use uh, with a stent uh, and a, a conventional stenting. Uh, sorry. Uh, just to, sh to show you the result at uh, uh, one at uh, after the angioplasty and the DCB, the same uh, like uh, after predilatation. And at follow up, uh, at two years, there is no problem because, as you can see here, the patient uh, didn't want to come to make uh, an, an angiography just to show uh, the good result at two, year, at two years. It was 80 years old. He, he had no problem and he didn't want to. He, he said, me, uh, me uh, let me uh, free, I am uh, okay. Um, another example, two years after, a 60 years old diabetic man, which had a history of LAD and circumflex angioplasty, and he uh, came from a, a chest pain since one month, and you can see here, you have an, um, and uh, de novo lesion on the osteal part of the circumflex with a very uh, positive FFR. It was uh, just a millimeter uh, proximal from the uh, old stent in the circumflex. And uh, we didn't want to induce uh, uh, um, uh, a problem on the left main or on, on the LED. And we didn't want to implant a stent on, the, uh, on this part of the circumflex can induce a few months uh, after some restenosis in the left main. So we decided to go for uh, DCB only angioplasty. You have seen uh, this uh, uh, very important uh, statement. This is DCB uh, <coughs> consensus group paper, and uh, it's very important to prepare the lesion. And I think one of the most important part of uh, the DCB angioplasty is the preparation of the lesion. You have to take your time. You will learn time after, during the evaluation, final evaluation. You have to keep in mind its one-to-one -one ratio for predilatation, but also for DCB uh, using uh, at final part. And it's very necessary for uh, me and for my colleague, I will explain you after, to use lesion modification device. And you will see they always use scoring balloon for all the patients. Sometimes they have to use cutting balloon uh, when there is recoil after the scoring balloon or arterectomy. The goal clearly is not to have a stent-like result. You have uh, to, you, your goal to, uh, is to achieve a stenosis less than 30%, and you, can, you have to learn to leave suboptimal uh, lesion, grad A or grad B, on angio, but not on OCT. And if you have a more than a B dissection, a C or G dissection, or E, you have to go for DES uh, implantation. So the scoring balloon for our patient, what is the interest of the scoring balloons? Clearly, uh, you have to size one-to-one -one with the artery, and you have to use it at low atmosphere. The interest of the balloon uh, are these three uh, elements, triangular elements in nylon uh, at each part of the balloon. And this, with these uh, three uh, elements, you can induce a very controlled intima cutting. And it's a difference, probably, which was, uh, which was explained by my uh, professor Alain Crebier a few years ago when he, he said, when you want uh, to have a good uh, angioplasty, you have uh, to be sure to have a good dissection. And I think if you want to be sure not to implant a stent and you want to do a balloon angioplasty alone, you have to uh, uh, be sure to have a control uh, dissection and not a scratch of the artery and not inducing a very important dissection. So you can see here the result of the uh, OCT on this uh, um, circumflex. Uh, it's not a perfect result. I am uh, completely agree. Yes, there is some uh, uh, stenosis. And you can see here at the right part at 3 o'clock the uh, control dissection. And you can see on the left part uh, the, uh, this image. After a lot of discu discussion with specialists of OCT in France, for them it was, OC uh, it was thrombus. And uh, we, this was confirmed at the final part after the DCB uh, implantation. And you can see here the DCB uh, uh, angioplasty with a result, with a good result on FFR, a good result on OCT. And uh, we have already had the discussion about, about OCT, but we don't need to do OCT because we don't need to see the malaposition of the stent because there is no stent. And at one year, there is no more problem for this patient. 
So I uh, will discuss with you in a few minutes of this uh, study. Uh, my colleague from La Rochelle for, uh, during a few years were using these DCB only uh, techniques of angioplasty. They treated 30 or 40 percent of their patients with these techniques. And at, in uh, 2019, they decided to evaluate uh, this, uh, the efficacy and security of this kind of angioplasty. So the, they enrolled all the patients during one year in their study. All the patients arriving in their cat lab were, un were enrolled. They only excluded the patient uh, unstable. Hemodynamic instability, isolated uh, left main lesion, um, low ejection fraction because they were afraid to uh, long uh, inflation uh, in this patient can be dangerous for the patient. But all the other patients were included in the uh, registry and more than 85% uh, of the patient of the patient were uh, were included in the no stent strategy. More than uh, near than uh, 1,000 procedure, 1,700 uh, lesion included, and uh, they prepared the lesion as it was described, with always using a scoring balloon uh, af after a semi-compliant balloon. Sometimes they use uh, aterectomy or cutting balloon. If they had a non uh, satisfying uh, result with uh, residual stenosis more than 30%, extensive dissection they do for a bailout technique with DUS. If the result was good, they go, they go for DCB at low atmosphere. And if after the DCB they have some uh, dissection, uh, they put a BMS not to have too much drug in the artery and also to make the difference be with, uh, with the B uh, bailout DUS um, in the uh, proximal uh, uh, part. So uh, this spot BMS was very rare, less than 2%, because the DCB is not here to uh, make the dilatation, only to uh, put the drug on the intima. So you can see here the result. More than two-thirds of the lesion uh, were able to treat uh, with DCB-only uh, balloon technique. Uh, this uh, DCB uh, ball uh, angioplasty uh, were in one group of with all the lesions were treated with DCB, and the mixed group, when some patient had more lesion, uh, one more than one lesion on the vessel, or more than two vessels treated, and one of the lesions were treated also with a stent. And uh, it's the reason why it's difficult to evaluate uh, the uh, clinical uh, follow-up, because it was only a clinical follow-up and not an angio uh, follow-up. You can see just here there is 20% uh, um, of the, uh, the lesion were treated were a bifurcation lesion. And what are the results? Uh, on the conventional group, the DES group, uh, remember it was a very unstable patient. You have more non STEMI patient, more STEMI patient. Uh, there is a, a high rate of uh, MACE. But when we see at the uh, DCB only group, it's very interesting to see there is very low uh, rate of MACE, only 4%, with only two MI, and no acute MI requiring uh, emergency procedure during the night that uh, can be a fear of a lot of uh, uh, angioplasticians, but uh, it's, it's never happened. And you can see the TLR is also very uh, low, only 1.6%, uh, and it's practically uh, the same than in the group of uh, Xion stents in the uh, absorb 3 trial. And remember, this low uh, rate of uh, with stenosis and low rate of uh, late thrombosis was one, was, was, uh, was, uh, one of the problems uh, for the BVS against uh, Xions. So, is it a new paradigm? Probably not. I think we are at the beginning of a, a new possibility to treat our patient. But I think the no stent strategy can be discussed for um, some patients, some lesion. And the no stent strategy is a controlled predilatation uh, technique 
associated with the DCB uh, using on the second, uh, second time. And in this uh, registry, you can see it's feasible in two thirds of the lesion with low mace rate, no acute MI. And we all know the potential interest of this uh, strategy. It's the same benefit than the BVS uh, expected with a positive remodeling, uh, physiology, uh, preserved arterial physiology, no encagement of the artery, and you avoid uh, the problem of the scaffold at long time and very late thrombosis. And fourth, the bifurcation clearly that we simplify the procedure. We don't have to manage the neocarina, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have uh, 10 minutes left for discussion. So, Philip. Uh, some interesting questions from the community. For sure. Yes, there are a lot of questions. Um, and some of them focus around the topic of DAPT more in general. So after for CCS patients, ACS patients. And then there's one very specific question. Um, as how soon can you stop DAPT in a patient with an ACS? and a known progressive cancer disease, for example. But I think this is a more general topic for discussion. No, I, I, I may answer it. it, it isn't, uh, uh, you can answer this question on the individual patient, I think. So it's, it, it, if you have no implant, fresh implant, it, it may be safer to stop DAPT than if you have a fresh stent. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I think uh, uh, in acute coronary syndrome, the need of DAPT is not necessarily related to the procedure uh, because if you implant a stent in a stable patient, uh, one month uh, is sufficient, uh, is related to the instability of the milieu of the patient. Uh, so the need to prolong a DAPT may be necessary even if you do drug coated balloon. Any further thoughts? Otherwise, I have a question, maybe in the direction of Bruno. Mm -hmm. How long does the drug or, or any of the p uh, available drugs from DCB persist in the vessel wall after DCB treatment? Um, so we know that we have with the uh, so-called high-dose DCB um, uh, with a, a, a paclitaxel load of three microcompass square millimeter balloon surface have a persistence uh, in the vessel wall of at least six months and still therapeutic tissue levels at six months. That's what we know from the animal model. And this explains why we have, despite a short contact time, we have a long-lasting biological effect. But you are confident to stop, if it's necessary, the DAPT before these three months? Or you are always led to a three months of DAPT? Um, so, so the recommendation of our consensus group is four weeks in stable patients, but we discussed this earlier, this is a uh, pure expert opinion. So we have not really the data to say we need four weeks or we may need no yeah. DAPT at all. That's, that's an open question. But we can at least say that all the uh, recommendations for longer duration of DAPT were mainly driven by the global prevention to, uh, of cardiovascular events and not by the, by the technique itself. Thank you. Uh, further questions uh, also come from the digital audience. Uh, more in general, acceptance of the DCP treatment. Is it difficult to convince the patients that uh, no stand is the correct treatment? I mean, it, it depends. It's not easy. It's, uh, it's not easy sometimes uh, to convince the referring physician that you did not place a stent. <laughs> uh, it's not easy to convince uh, the cat lab technician, the nurse, uh, because uh, in the other room uh, where the, uh, your colleague has placed the stent has a better result than you. So you, f you, do not, uh, you are not perceived as a good angioplasty doctor. I think you you have to convince the patient that there is a difference between be, between the acute result and the uh, long term result. It's uh, a bit the same when we discuss uh, between cabbage <coughs> or angioplasty with stents. Sometimes you say uh, it's, it's uh, 
it's better for you to have cabbage because at long time we say there is no stenosis, etc., etc. And some, probably, I think with this kind of techniques, we can discuss for long term for the patient. And clearly, uh, at, uh, it's difficult for uh, for us and for the physician to let a, a 30% stenosis at the final uh, result. But if we are convinced uh, that it can be benefic for the patient, I think. Uh, it's not the patients that we have to convince, it's the physicians we have to, we have to convince. It's, it's a cultural reset, uh, really. <laughs> my, my standard answer is uh, it's not our job to do coronary cosmetics, but to produce good long-term clinical results for the patients, and uh, sometimes we have to wait. I, mean, I think in some situations, uh, the stent uh, may be superior, uh, or maybe equivalent, but uh, for example, in your first case uh, by Dr. Godin, uh, the proximal LED with the trifurcation, uh, I think uh, to have done a DCB there uh, has really simplified the procedure, because if you place a stent, then you have carina shift, you have to do double balloon inflation, maybe triple balloon, etc., etc. So in some situation, maybe a clear, not long-term, but just immediate advantage. Thank you. One last question, yeah. and then I'm gone. Then we have yeah. um, more specific, is there data on specifically diabetic patients after DCB treatment? <laughs> we, are, we are planning uh, some trials in that. Uh, I think uh, diabetic patients is a specific milieu where Maybe they don't tolerate a foreign body. Maybe they react uh, with inflammatory reactions. So I think it's definitely, if I have to do a trial, I would go to diabetic first. Yeah. I mean, we have this subgroup analysis from, ex for example, from the basket small two. And as expected, the, the difference was the same in diabetics and non-diabetics between DCB and DES but the event rate was, was in overall much higher in, in diabetic patients. And, and this is a high-risk population, as Antonio said, which is worth to be uh, investigated in more detail. After uh, DCB and uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, can we have the courage to stop it one month later for general surgery and resume it later? I, I think so. I, I, I don't think we should use the word courage. We can stop after one month. Uh, I have two short questions. Is there any role of bare metal stents after lesion preparation? If, if it is, please explain us what it is. And the second one, what about venous grafts? Thanks. Venous graft. Yes. But I don't think there is any role for bare metal stent after DCB. Uh, we have published uh, many years ago maybe five or five or four years ago, a paper of a, a case series of patients treated with DCB and uh, DES to get intentionally. Uh, we even now we intentionally in patient with uh, bad renal failure, creatinine over four on dialysis, we routinely use DCB and DES uh, to mm -hmm. because it's such a high risk stenosis rate. So I, I, I don't think, uh, and the, the, uh, these trials, when they use a DES, a, a meta stent, uh, and the DCB, the result we are not yeah. so good. No, they, they were disappointing, and therefore the recommendation is, in, in the case of bailout standing after DCB, you should use a Lymus DES. So this is the current uh, yeah. recommendation for this. And, and Venus grafts, sorry. Venus. Um, in, in graft, in Venus graft. Uh, oh. I, I, don't, NDCB, touch NDCB, NDCB. don't touch it. Don't touch it. Yesterday they asked this question and we, we answered that we have limited experience. So I think in the interest of time I have uh, to conclude. Uh, my, uh, my final word is uh, that we should not use anymore the word dissection alone. Dissection should be A, B, C, or bad or good, acceptable or non-acceptable. But the word dissection alone uh, has a negative connotation and should not be used because dissection can have a positive connotation. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you.